love the way the book describes cardiac muscle cells. We all want to be described like this. Short, fat, and branched. Okay? They're interconnected, cardiac muscle cells are. They're striated. What does that mean? Yeah, look at this. We can pull up a picture, and we can zoom up a picture. That's the cool thing about these PowerPoints. Look right here. There's cardiac muscle. See this cell right here? Branches down. There's branches on it. Skeletal muscle does not have that. Skeletal muscle does have these little stripes, right? What are those called? Striations. Who remembers from AMP1 what forms them? And he's correct, kind of. It's the way the actin and myosin overlap. It's the way the actin and the myosin overlap. The little proteins in the sarcomeres, right? It's the way that they overlap. Anyway, cardiac muscle has something that skeletal muscle does not have. It has these really dark looking lines. Those are called intercalated discs. Those are where the cells join end to end. Intercalated discs. Some people say intercalated discs. What's special about the intercalated disc? Well, it joins the cells. What's inside of that disc that makes it special? Ha ha. Look here. Here's a branch cell. Here's the disc. Inside of that disc, we have gap junction. Gap conjunction junction. Don't try to draw it. You don't have to draw the whole thing. Look what I'm showing you. Here's one cell with it. They don't just have two branches, but look. One cell goes to two. These two cells can branch to four. The four could branch to more. Here's the point. If we started with the impulse right here, it could spread from one to two to four to eight to 16 really rapidly when they branch, a lot more rapidly than if they did not. What is a gap junction? Here's a gap junction. I think we're zoomed just a little too much. A gap junction, here's one cell, and here's another cell. A gap junction contains a little channel between the cells. What does that channel between the cells allow? Yeah, stuff to get in and out. That's a good way to say it. It allows for communication between the cytoplasm of the two different cells. Because cardiac muscle has gap junction, it helps the impulse to spread through the cells. Helps the impulse spread through the cells. Anybody remember the word desmosome from AMP1? What's a desmosome? Tell me more than it holds it together. You're absolutely right. Give me just a little more. It's the strongest junction. The strongest junction between cells. It definitely holds it together. So we put all these things in our mind together about cardiac muscle. And the way that we take it deeper in AMP2 is we don't just memorize that cardiac muscle has interplated discs that have desmosomes and gap junctions. We want to know what that does for the cell or what that does for the heart. The desmosomes would hold these cells together so that when the cells start to contract, they don't separate. So it helps to keep them strong. We don't want our heart ripping apart, do we? We want it held together really tightly. So the desmosomes are used. I know, it's nice, nice to have machines, but they really shouldn't reload right outside of during class time. Oh, well. And the gap junctions 
allow for the impulse to rapidly be transmitted through the cell. Isn't that kind of what the branching does? Allows it to spread to more cells quicker? The big, the big deal then is this. We say cardiac muscle functions as this word. A syncytium. Raise your hand if you heard that in AMP1. Cardiac muscle functions as a syncytium. <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I'm going <clears throat> to my AMP1 suit. I, I know you heard it. You just don't remember you heard it. Anybody tell me what syncytium means? Right on. Look, I gave you a clue right here. See right above it? It's multiple cells working as a single unit. Cells working together. Andy, did you take Latin in high school? No? Why'd you giggle? I took Latin in high school. You know what taking Latin in high school does for you? Aside making you a nerd. It teaches you root words. It teaches you a lot about language. And sin means together. And sight means cells. Em, process, condition, something like that. Syncytium, the condition of cells working together. That's what it literally means. It means multiple cells functioning as a unit. Do you think you want this? And this is the ugliest heart I think I've ever drawn. I'm sure I'll do an uglier one for you next time, though, just to prove myself wrong. But anyway, when I do this, these are the atria up top. And these little ventricles, they're not really that small, but my whole point was to show you the thickness of the muscle here. So you can see that ventricular muscle is very, very thick. And when the ventricle contracts, guys, it needs to contract on both sides and contract rhythmically up through here in order with the cells as a unit so that, watch me for a second, so that when it squeezes, it squeezes collectively and pushes blood up. Would it make sense, and you can look back up there, for the ventricle to begin contracting here and here and here? If a ventricle contracted across the top, it would narrow the top, and that would tend to push blood that way, would it not? And that would defeat the purpose. So where do you think the ventricle contraction needs to start? Nice at the apex, which is right here. And then it proceeds rhythmically up, functioning as a single coordinated unit, a syncytium. What things, what facts, what factors of connect cardiac muscle, sorry, allow it to function as a syncytium? Gap junction? Look, I just underlined the answer for you. And the branching. It is the disc, yes, because it contains gap junctions. So it's the gap junctions and the branching of the fibers that allow heart muscle to do that. Otherwise, if that were not the case, guys, maybe it would get a contraction here and then a contraction here, then one here, then one over here, then here, then here. Would that pump? Absolutely not. It would not pump. So we need the heart to work like it works. All right. A couple other little tidbits. Let's see if there's anything on here that we did not cover. No, we got all that. We got the desmosomes and we got the gap junction. We're good with that. Let's pull up PowerPoint B. By the way, I put all these PowerPoints on for you on Blackboard yesterday, and I went ahead and opened up Chapter 19, 20, and 21 as well, so you can get all of them for the next test. Some cool things about cardiac muscle contraction before I get into what I told you I was going to talk about. Cardiac muscle is autorhythmic. You will see that word spelled on another slide. Right here they say cardiac muscle cells have automaticity. I never say that word except because it's there. They're autorhythmic. That means they have their own rhythm and they actually set their own beat. See, most people don't know this, and it's a really, really cool fact. The heart can beat without your brain. 
Did you know that? How many people think they knew that already? A couple people. When they do a heart transplant and somebody gets, yeah, right, they have to cool that heart off to keep it from beating. But when they put it in the new person, they attach the blood vessels. At this point, they are not attaching any nerves. They only suture up the vessel and get it to where blood will flow smoothly through there. They warm up the heart, and then commonly they'll thump the heart a little bit, and it'll start beating. And it has no nerves attached to it because heart muscle generates its own impulse. Isn't that cool? It's way cool. That does not mean the brain can't control it, but in someone that has a heart transplant, the brain cannot control their heart. Wow. We had, it was really cool, we had a guy that had a heart transplant a few years ago come speak to one of our, well, not one of our classes, came to speak to one class, and then we crammed like 100 people in the room to listen to him. And that's the coolest thing. At that point in time, I had never really thought about and studied heart transplants much, and I didn't know they didn't reconnect nerves. So how can a, what if somebody with a heart transplant goes to exercise? So your nervous system would usually increase the heart rate because of the demands and the way that everything works. It can't do that. However, there's other factors that control the heart. Don't certain hormones do it? The stretch of the heart matters and stuff. So the heart can regulate itself a little bit, Maybe not as well as it could with the nervous system. This man, he was in his 40s, he happened to get the heart of an 18-year-old athlete. And he said it was, they told him that it wouldn't work like this, but when he would try to exercise, he said that that kid's heart was in such great shape that it, his heart rate went up almost like a normal person. It was fascinating, you know. We all got goosebumps and it was really cool. It was a cool thing. What's the absolute refractory period? And he got to meet the kid's family eventually. That was pretty cool. Nobody remembers absolute refractory period? Come on, I taught it to you during Thanksgiving. And I used Thanksgiving to tell you about it. You don't remember? You know? During halftime of the game, Grandma comes out with another piece of pie and she tries, you know, that kind of thing. Y'all don't remember that? All right, here's what an absolute refractory period is. That's where, um, if we're talking about a muscle, and really it doesn't have to do with that, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it this way and then I'll say it another way when we're doing depolarization or repolarization. It's when another contraction cannot occur for a brief period of time. Another contraction cannot occur for a brief period of time. The why is an electrical reason, which I'll explain in a second. But what we'll see and notice with the heart is that a heart has to rest after every contraction. Imagine if it didn't. What if your heart went into, wait, think about this. If we're going like this, that's still rest, right? The contract, the rest part. If your heart didn't rest, that would be a spasm. You ever get a Charlie horse or a spasm? You ever have a heart spasm? Your heart might flutter, but your heart never seizes up and contracts and locks up. It's impossible to do that because the heart has an absolute refractory period that's long enough that makes it rest after every contraction. It protects the heart from doing that. That does not mean the heart always beats right. It doesn't mean the heart can't flutter and do all kinds of crazy things. It just means that it cannot go tetanic or into tetanus and seize up and stay in contraction. Okay, now's the fun time. Instead of reading off the slides, this goes so much better if we do some little picture stuff. We're going to do depolarization and repolarization now. We're going to talk about 
skeletal muscle at first, because you guys might have seen this uh, skeletal muscle stuff before. You may remember when you did skeletal muscle that at one point you probably saw a graph that looked like that. And we called it a muscle twitch. Just give me a show of hands if you remember any kind of graph that looked like that. Yay, team. Whenever you see a graph, there's going to be a line here, right? And there's going to be a line across the bottom. And you know, it's usually on graph paper. I'm not going to try to draw the graph paper that and mess this all up. Yeah. So when you see this, the, the first two things you always want to do is you want to know, what does it mean right here? What is this telling me? And most of the time, <laughs> funny I use that word, that tells you how long something takes. Usually that is time. How long does this event take to occur? Whatever the event is. See, watch, I'll draw another one over here. We could have one that looks like this, right, on its little graph. Tell me about the time of this. Short. What do you think this height is? Yeah, it's the intensity or the strength of the signal, of the electrical signal. For electrical, I commonly abbreviate it with a little electron. That's just what I do, because electricity is kind of electron movement, ion movement, stuff like that. But anyway, strength or the intensity of the electrical signal. You know what another way to say is? This is the millivolt. That's the millivolt. That's the charge. Okay, here's a cell. Wow, not bad. Tell me what ion is in a greater concentration outside of the cell. Sodium is correct. What ion is higher inside, Amber? Potassium. Correcto. That is nature's way. That is how it works in cells. There's usually, there is, flat out, more sodium outside, more potassium inside. Does that mean there's no sodium inside? No, just means there's less. Does that mean there's no potassium out there? No, just means there's less outside, okay? So it's understood that there's less of the other in each place. I never write that. I don't want this to get clogged up and um, messy and put too much there for you. Let me ask you a couple of generic questions. If I open the channel here for sodium, which way would sodium move? Yeah, you guys nailed that. It would move in. Why would sodium move in? Trish, why would sodium move in? Because everything moves according to a concentration gradient. And what direction is the movement going to go in normal situation? From, from high to low, Carolina. From high to low is right. Why from high to low? Okay, here's the simple answer. The most simple answer on the planet. If I had a bottle of perfume right here, and I took the cap off, who would be the first person in the room to smell it? Me and Stacy, right? Why would we smell it first? Because we're closest. And tell me, where's the high concentration of perfume? in the bottle, and where does the perfume start to go? To the low concentration, right? That's just nature's way of doing things. It works like that. Things go from high to low. You ever make sun tea? doesn't matter if you've ever made it or not. We know the concept. You take water, you take a jug, you put tea bags in it, you set it outside. What happens to it? In one instant, does it all turn tea color? 
oh, maybe it starts to diffuse and maybe it gets more tea color around the bag at first and darker and darker. And, and then pretty soon it diffuses, it moves enough away from the high concentration to where it's equal throughout. That's the way things work. They always try to equalize. So sodium would move in until it could equalize, but we never let that happen. The channels only stay open for a little bit. So here's back to our concept. If we open sodium up, sodium would move in, correct? Do you remember what kind of charge sodium has? Just look up there. It's there for you. So we're saying we're taking what charge is in here at this point. See that? We're taking positives in. Do you know when this cell is at rest? what its internal charge is when measured between here and here. What's the charge here versus what's the charge here? Anybody know? Where is it negative 70, Judy? Yes. Now, all cells are different, and cardiac muscles, the book may not say negative 70. I just like to keep things congruent, and I don't care that you know the exact number. But I will tell you, they say the inside of the cell is negative. And its measurement is in millivolts. And yeah, commonly it's somewhere between 70 and 90. I, I won't be asking you the number, okay? The number's not the concept part for me. Why is the inside negative? This is what I want everybody to really grasp. Well, that's a good answer, but that's not, that's not what, um, what causes it to be negative. It's a real simple answer. And here it is. What's out here? How much? A ton. What's in here? Potassium. Do you think this can possibly hold as much as all the space out here can hold? You can just see and visualize that, right? Looks like there's a lot of space out here the way that I've drawn it. So would there be more pluses outside? What does that mean is inside? Fewer positive or less positive, correct? Instead of saying the inside is less positive or contains fewer positive, they just say it's the opposite. If the outside is positive, they will now say the inside is less. How much less? It's 70 less. So they call it a negative 70 millivolt. That's where that comes from. It's less. So they flip it on you and say it's 70 less, and they throw a negative there for you to comprehend that. Okay? That's all. It's really not that big of a, a thing. So let's back up. And you may have to draw this picture again because, you know, I have the capacity to erase it. The resting membrane potential of a cell on the inside is where it's at. It's always negative. And I'm just giving that number for a reason. We'll see. That is at rest. Say RMP, resting membrane potential. When we depolarize a cell, this happened. Tell me what that means. More specific, Andy. Sodium moves in. Depolarization allows sodium to move in. Hey, Stacy, tell me, what kind of charge does sodium take in with it? A positive. So what would happen to this number? Watch. Would it go negative 69, negative 68? Because it's getting positives, right? Do you see that? And then it would go negative 67. I'm not going to do this full depolarization, repolarization thing, threshold, the whole nerve impulse. That's not my point. My point is to get you to see when it depolarizes, 
sodium rushes in, and actually this becomes positive on the inside. That's how much sodium rushes in. Enough that it goes from negative 70 really all the way to about positive 30. And I'm not here this semester to make you memorize those numbers. Okay? But it goes from the negative inside to the positive. Yeah. Yeah. Right on. Because it's opposite. That's, that's why we call it. Yeah. Here's my uh, next little deal. After we've depolarized, are the sodiums in their normal location? Well, where are they supposed to be mostly? But what has happened? They've reversed and gone in, right? Is that normal? No, that's normal for depolarization, but that's not the resting state, correct? So just understand, it's not normal yet. And the inside is positive. Well, the second step is this. Look at the word I just put. Throw something on the end of that for me, please. Good, repolarization. Who remembers what that is? Keisha got it, because it starts with a K, and it's in your memory banks. All right, potassium channels open for repolarization. The repolarization is all about potassium. Now tell me, potassium can only move which way? Out. Why? Because that's where it's high, right? Because potassium is high inside. It doesn't matter how many sodiums we just pushed in there. It's all about the potassium now. Sodium channels are closed up. And potassium moves out. Hey, Stacy, what charge does potassium take out with it? Positive. So look, what happens to the inside? It goes back to negative because it's lost its positive. So maybe, just maybe, I'll erase all of this and draw it again and go through it again because it's one of those things. Really on this, it never hurts to hear it more than once. And at the end, to kind of <coughs> hammer it in. So here we go. Here's our cell. Tell me, where's the sodium? So do I just write it like that in A plus or do I do something else? What's that mean? There's a higher concentration. What do I put in here? More potassium. At rest, the charge is positive or negative? Inside or outside? Good deal. The, when we depolarize, what channels open? And which way does it move? In. And what does that make the charge in here now? It now becomes positive. Then we repolarize, which opens potassium channel, and now the charge goes back to negative. So here's one, here's two, here's three. Negative, positive, negative. Okay. RMP is the one. Depolarization is the two. Repolarization is the three. I'll give you a second to get that. Yes, ma'am. Yep. We're talking about when we do the overall charge, we're doing all of them combined. So the, the overall charge of negative 70 inside is due to all of the positive and negative ions. We don't focus on every ion, though. We just focus on those two because they're the important ones that move. Okay? When we're talking channels, then, we're talking about specific ions. Depolarization and repolarization are what kind of event? Electrical, right? We measure the charge. Those are electrical events. So go back to your graph. On my graph, look here what I'm going to put in. Negative, 
positive. So at the very start, right here, when our charge is negative, what do we call this potential? You see, that's where it's at rest. And then when it goes to positive, see it moving up to positive, it takes a little time. What do we call this upward hill? Depolarization. And tell me, what's the charge up here? Positive. And what ions was it due to? Sodium. See how not bad that really is? I mean, it's not really as bad. It'll still take you some time. What happens to, here's my question, the sodium channels when we get to the top? Good, they close. There's no more sodium movement. They just shut. And when those shut, what opens? Potassium. And what do we call that? Repolarization. And what happens to the charge? It goes back towards the resting charge. It becomes negative. See, that's what the graph meant. When you saw a muscle twitch, a muscle twitch was the event of depolarization and repolarization on a graph. And on a skeletal muscle, this time period is very, very short for a twitch. Very short. Anybody have any questions to this point? I'm sorry, I know this takes a lot of time to go through, but it's something that I know if I don't explain it really well, then you won't understand it at all. I've seen it semester after semester for, you know, nine out of ten people will get lost in this if I don't take my time going through. Pardon? Well, it's electrochemical, right? Because the chemicals are the charges. So sure, Amy. Check this out. Anybody want to take a wild guess what this is? This is a graph of cardiac muscle. Tell me about the time. Well, that sure looks longer to me. You know? Right? It's a lot longer. The height, it doesn't look that much taller to me. It looks about the same height. What if I tell you that there's a negative there, that there's a positive there, and that back here it goes back to negative? Cardiac muscle. What would we call this part? <coughs> Stacy, what would we call it? Huh? We would call it depolarization. You are absolutely correct. Can you tell me what ion moved? Sodium, the first one. And the charge became what? Positive. That happens in heart muscle just like it happens in regular muscle. That's why, look, this part looks the same. Isn't that cool? Okay, take a wild guess right here what closes. And take a wild guess what opens. Yes. And so what do we start calling this right here when it starts dropping? We start calling it repolarization. Okay? Uh, um, we're going there. Kind of. So why and what does this leveling mean? Okay, what, what does height tell us? This is positive, this is negative, right? So this tells us that we're at a certain number, right? Let's say we're at positive 10. It doesn't matter what we're at, okay? That's, not, that's just me making up a number out of the air, okay? Don't own that number, please. But let's say at, once it hits about positive 10, please don't write that down. Please don't quote me on that. Here's what happens. Hmm. I'm going to draw a picture. Look. What's that called? And then what's this called? Right. And what's moving? 
Little K's are moving out. What kind of charge are they taking? So what if, at the exact same time, look here. What if I started to move some different positives in? Could I balance the charge momentarily? Move one out, move one in. Move one out, move one in. And keep it stable? In the heart, when we get to this right here, calcium channels open. And it moves in. It's easier to see up here. This makes it visually very easy to understand for most people. So for a brief period of time, we've created a situation where it's staying fairly level. It's not 100% level. It's not equal. You'll see in the book. I'll show you a picture in a second. But the whole point is they call this a plateau phase. During the middle of what process? During the middle of repolarization. We plateau. The plateau is completely due to what ion? Calcium. Have you heard that calcium is important for your heart? Maybe you have at some point. Have you ever heard of calcium channel blockers? And maybe they affect your heart's ability to pump its rate, its rhythm, its strength, and things like that. Cool. If you block the calcium channel, can you see that it would repolarize faster? Right? Wow, cool. That's cool. then what must happen here to allow this repolarization to finish? The calcium must close. What's still moving? The potassium, and it repolarizes right there. So there's a couple of things that I want you to understand about this. What kind of events are all of these events that I just showed you? Electrical events, or like Andy likes to say, electrochemical. But we'll just call them electrical, but they are electrochemical. What, how do these electrical events relate to what the heart does? Perfect, sir. Did you guys hear that? The electrical events tell the heart when to contract and relax. The electrical events tell the heart when to contract and when to relax. You want to just be bold and brave and take a wild guess? Which event tells the heart to contract? Well, in my brain, I think contract comes before relax. So the first event, the depolarization, is the signal that tells muscle to contract, whether it's heart or skeletal. Depolarization is the signal that tells what to contract? The muscle. Therefore, by the same token, what is repolarization? Right. It's the signal that tells muscle to relax. Relax. Pardon, Andy? Why, looky there. It's no, but, but yes. I mean, it, it relates to it, but we'll kind of have to get there. So let's look at this uglier graph right here now. So tell me something about this. When we do this, what do we call it? And what does that tell the muscle to do? Contract. So look, it's going to contract for a long time because it won't be told to relax until when? Until the repolarization's done. That's kind of fascinating. The heart kind of squeezes when it contracts. It doesn't just smack the blood. So look up here at me for a second instead of on the board. So I want you to see this. 
And we're doing ventricles right now. That's what we're really talking about are the ventricles. See, the atria contract, and this stuff happens in the atria, but we're really talking about the big muscle. Atria contract, push blood down. Ventricles receive the blood, ventricles fill up, and then they contract. And what if they just went like this and just smacked the blood? How much would move out? Not much. So they want to pump. So here's what they do. They contract and squeeze and hold for a brief period of time, and then they let go. And that ensures that more blood leaves. And the stronger they do that, or the longer they do that, the more blood gets pushed out. All right? So therefore, your heart squeezes, but then it must do what? It must relax, because it has a long absolute refractory period as well. Why is it necessary for it to relax? To refill. If it never relaxed, it couldn't refill, and it couldn't contract again. So with your heart, there's a maximum number of times your heart can beat a minute because its contraction can only get so fast because of that. can only get so fast, and it must relax. It must relax as well. So there's a maximum pulse rate that you can achieve. All right? And the heart cannot go faster than that because of its physiology, because of its absolute refractory period, and because of the little bitty plateau phase there. Plateau doesn't have to always be the same length. That can change, but it has a plateau. It's never going to be like skeletal muscle. Okay. Cool. Cis well, systolic and diastolic, we're going to do in, in lab next week. Actually, this week you're going to listen to the integrity for that lab, and it's going to explain it, and then we can talk about it later. Because systolic and diastolic blood pressure... And it does relate to when the heart's contracting versus when it's relaxing. But that's a big concept to not, to do just like that, I'm just saying. Yes, ma'am. Right, but this, this is not the measurement of the squeezing and all that. This is the electrical signal. I'm just telling you that this is the signal that tells it to contract, and then it stays in contraction until it is told to relax. You're correct. So the longer this plateau is, the longer your heart would stay in contraction. Okay? And that also corresponds to how long it's going to relax for as well, because the absolute refractory period kind of follows that pattern as well. So look, we did all this stuff. Instead of doing bullets and memorizing numbers, and you can see, I was telling you, see, the book uses different numbers, but look, Depolarization opens sodium channel. The membrane reverses from negative to positive. That's cool. And then we said calcium prolongs, well, really I don't say it prolongs the depolarization phase because repolarization has started. But repolarization is not complete until the end. All right? So there's two ways to look at that. And then there's the graph. Now, I will tell you, this is not actually a skeletal muscle graph. A skeletal muscle graph would be much tighter. It would be almost straight up and straight down on this. But the sloping, we can kind of look at and say, oh, that makes sense. That's what we talked about with skeletal muscle. Really, this graph shows us how that leads to the squeezing and the tension development. And it's nice and slow. Anyway, we said all that. I like the way that I did it a little better than that slide. Here is depolarization. Look how spiky they really show it being. Here is the plateau phase. And here's the completion of repolarization down here. Okay. And, yeah, that's good. That's cool. All right, our next topic. We're just going to begin the next topic. Here's the word I wanted you to have earlier. Cardiac muscle is autorhythmic. The cells can generate their own impulse. It's amazing. I find the heart fascinating. 
Honestly, if I was going back to school, I'd probably be a cardiologist this time around because it's just so cool. Here's a picture of the heart. It's a different picture than what you've seen so far. Look, what color is this? Yeah, that's yellow, right? Right, yellowish, green. Uh, honestly, trust me, on your computer, it's yellow. In AMP, what stuff do they usually draw yellow? I couldn't hear you. Neurons and stuff. The nervous system, neurons, nerves, they usually draw yellow. I don't know if you've noticed that. That's just what they do. Lymphatic stuff, they draw green. Arteries, they draw red. And veins, they draw blue. They, you know, they're trying to help us out a little bit there. Here's the cool thing about the heart. New slide. Our next topic. is the cardiac conduction system. Now, I'm only introducing it today, okay? Cardiac conduction system. And I'm actually going to give you a definition of it that I want you to write down. You know, I don't always do that a lot. I did it for the endocrine system. Endocrine system is a network of, makes chemicals called, travels through the, goes, looking for, uh, receptors on target cells. Cool. Cardiac conduction system is a network of specialized. Watch me. What does that say? Cardiac muscle cells. that generates and conducts an impulse through the heart. Cardiac conduction system. A network of specialized what? Cardiac muscle cells that generates and conducts an impulse through what organ? The heart. So let's conceptualize that and think about it for a second. What kind of cells are we talking about in the heart? Cardiac muscle cells, heart muscle cells. What does muscle normally do? Two things, contract or relax, right? This is special. It's specialized muscle. It's got a different function. What's its function? Read your second half of your... What kind of cells usually generate and conduct impulses? Nerve cells. So this part of the heart that you're seeing in this picture right here, all the yellow stuff, those are heart muscle cells that are acting like neurons. That's actual cardiac muscle that has lost its contractility and conducts the impulse through the heart. So cool. Pardon me, Andy? That's all the yellow stuff. I will finish it next time, but I do want you to get, before you leave today, look up here. What chamber am I in? Right atrium. This little bundle of cells right here is called the SA node. I'm totally down with you abbreviating that because it's called the SA node all the time. Yeah, it stands for sinoatrial, but I'll let you abbreviate it. This is your pacemaker. It generates your normal rhythm of your heart. Your normal heartbeat is started right there. And it spreads. You see it spreads. And it goes through this network. Okay. Wow. Does anybody know? What's a normal heartbeat? Normal heart rate? Well, it varies. But average person, they say 72 to 75 is your normal average person. All right. The SA node intrinsically, that means of itself, likes to fire at 100 beats per minute. That's what I'm telling you, okay? The SA node loves to fire at 100. Is your heartbeat usually 100? 
So what must be slowing it down if all things are equal? Look, look here. Your parasympathetic nervous system at rest is active and it decreases the impulses to the SA node, which slows it. So if you didn't have nerves connected to your heart, your resting heart rate would be higher because your nervous system wouldn't be slowing it down. That's cool. At rest, our nervous system puts a little brake on the heart. It slows the heart down. So our resting heart rate is slower. The better shape you're in, the more your parasympathetic nervous system comes alive and the more it lowers your heart rate because your heart's so efficient at pumping. So if your resting heart rate's 60, that's good. That's good. If your resting heart rate's 80, you might want to start going to the gym a little bit, working on that. Yes, sir. That's it for today.